I'm delighted to welcome you here this evening to the first of our events to mark Biodiversity Week. I'm Jane from Waterford Libraries, and I'd like to thank our council teams from the libraries, from the Europe Direct Centre, and from the Environment Department for organising this week of free events to help us to learn all about biodiversity and how to protect and improve our local ecosystems. I'm particularly delighted to welcome Mary Reynolds here as our keynote speaker this evening. Mary has had a long and a very successful career as a landscape designer, as a best-selling author, and as a nature activist. And she has brought all that experience with her when she began to think in a different way. Mary realized one day that she had to stop what she was doing, that she needed to step up and that she needed to ask people to give their gardens back to nature. Mary is asking us to change the way we think as gardeners. She is asking us to wake up and to become guardians instead. She would like us to stop fighting nature and to work with it and to encourage those weeds, encourage untidiness, and by doing so, to encourage life to return. Mary is going to talk about her work for about 25 or 30 minutes this evening. And after that, she'd be very happy to answer your questions. So if you could use the chat function to ask questions during Mary's talk or afterwards, the library staff are on hand to collate that, um, your questions and to ask Mary when the talk is over. So enjoy the talk. And now, Mary, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jane. Thanks, Sinead and everybody um, for coming along tonight. Uh, it's a very unusual way of doing things, but it is what it is. So I'm going to I'm going to try and make this um, uh, turn into something here now and try and get this moving so, so we can into full screen. OK, right. So um, We Are the Ark is uh, a movement which I started about I suppose it's two years ago now, um, and it's kind of taken off around the world um, with the power of a simple idea, you know. Um, I started, the idea came to me one day when I was sitting at my desk designing a garden, looking down over um, my lawn, and it was a winter's morning, and a fox ran past, and soon after, uh, a couple of hairs chasing the fox and you know I kept looking and, and a little while later a hedgehog ran across the base of the hedge just outside and I thought this is very strange um it reminded me of Noah's Ark but I thought you know uh mostly these would be nocturnal creatures and um they should be you know the hedgehog especially should be hibernating and I thought I better go and check what's going on you know so I walked outside and I walked in the direction they'd run from up to the end of my lane and it's a small country lane uh, very little traffic and on and across the end across the road was um this beautiful thicket of a field which had been impenetrable with uh kind of a um a medium mix of you know blackthorn and hawthorn and brambles and gorse and wild plants at the edges and it was completely impenetrable but somebody had got planning permission at the top of the field and they'd gone in with a digger and they'd cleared out the field to make a garden without any thought for the creatures we were sharing the land with or, or that had made homes there. And I, I kind of stood there absolutely horrified because I had done this myself so many times. And it was kind of a moment of no going back, you know? So I, um, I went back inside and thought, where are all the creatures gone? You know, I started remembering how when we were young, um, you know, there was, you drive along at night and you'd come home and your windscreen would be covered in dead bugs, as they call them in America, or you would, um, you know, open your windows at night and it'd fill with moths. And I remember stories that my dad used to tell about how the sun would be blocked out for moments when flocks of migratory birds would go overhead. And I remember going out in the mornings when I was small and collecting a uh, family of hedgehogs just before you know, just as dawn was breaking and bringing them into the kitchen to play with them. God love them. But, you know, I, <laughs> you know, I didn't know any better, but the point was that they were there. Um, 
and they're all very hard to find now because they only have those wild places to live they can't go out into agricultural land because there's so many chemicals being used and their habitats are being reefed out at, at a rate of knots you know hedgerows are being destroyed at a ridiculous rate with absolutely no concept of their value um there seems to be a very strong disconnection between nature and what 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 is required you know so i started this movement called this is an arc and i said if people could put up a sign in their gardens um to share our land with other creatures it would make a huge difference and create a patchwork quilt of arcs that hopefully would eventually connect up and spread around the globe and create an awareness of how much we're losing because not only can they not go into agricultural land they can't go into our gardens so that's the fox i didn't take a picture of him. my friend claire did I have a different fox so this would be a typical garden um these days a modern garden there's lots of different varieties of and ways of looking at it but the thing about gardens is that they are com they are what people consider to be their experience of nature so they go out into gardens to feel at one with nature to feel some connection to the earth and the reality is that gardens are not safe places for wildlife they're not related to nature they're not the real deal true nature is much more messy it's full of um it's it's a complete ecosystem and i know that in our small patches we can't create complete ecosystems but i'll go through that bit by bit um this is just another example so like a long long time ago when the earth had a full set of clothes as i call it um and we were subject to the to the to the laws of the natural world it was completely understandable that people would go out and create these little corrals um to, you know they made sense to grow food and to stay safe from the from the wild predators that were out there whatever they felt scared about um and and to keep other people out to protect whatever they had their reasons for i'm not a historian i just know it's basic stuff but um it the gardens gradually began to represent um human separation from each other and their severed connection with the natural world um so th this is what gardens became um so they so and we be, we we changed who we are so we be, so rather than being purposeful guardians of this earth um which is our role in this web of life um we became kind of without you know we treated the earth without boundaries or ownership and instead we became plant artists you know garden designers landscape architects earth sculptures statement makers um working with and designing with you know a living sentient canvas um and materials of our choice um but gardens are actually green deserts for our shared kin because even though creativity is a, is a vital part of life we're going to have to learn how to create these spaces which you know and uh, without causing damage to nature it's time to learn to share basically um so we need a wave of change in the gardening industry which it is it is an industry and it's all about profit and you know like any other industry it only it only exists if we support it so if we step off that treadmill and even give half of any land we have under our care back to nature so that she can support all the other creatures we are hopelessly and completely dependent upon um it would make a massive difference so this it's um it's unfortunately gardens have got away with being damaging for a long time so there's a kind of a a false belief that it's a green activity but actually they're filled with non-native plants which have not evolved within the local food web and so they're not supportive of life and its intricate relationships um gardens and nurseries are full of uh chemicals and pesticides and they're the largest sellers of chemicals and pesticides followed closely by agriculture they now typically use um 10 times as many chemicals as agriculture does per acre um and the growth and distribution of landscaping plants that have been grown in heated greenhouses with a very carbon heavy beginning um has caused uh, a kind of a real disconnect from what the land itself wants to become in order to support as many life forms as possible because you know a, a native ecosystem keeps us safe and well 
and cleans our water, cleans our air, gives us food, gives us shelter. Um, it's basic stuff without a, a working ecosystem, life can't continue to, to survive. Um, so the art concept is challenging a whole group of people who depend on the industry to survive. I do realize that, but I think that everything needs to change if we're going to survive the collapse of biodiversity, which is much, much less discussed and much less understood than climate change. Um, but it's very simple for people to see that we've, we're missing everything, that everything is gone, that it's quiet out there. We're, we're dealing with what Rachel Carson would have called a silent spring. So even though you might hear the birds in the morning, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's very different from when we were young. It's, it's, um, there's a concept called shifting baseline syndrome where each, where each generation has a different concept of what is natural. And um, it kind of, it's, it's like what we see as being damaged and destroyed ecosystems, our kids will see as being nature you know and that's kind of what's happened with gardens and parks because a lot of urbanized people which is the way we we we, we live mostly now um are so disconnected from nature that they don't understand that actually what 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 a working ecosystem looks like even on a small scale um there seems to be a very strong disconnection anyway um I just keep moving on here um Luckily, there's huge opportunities for people involved in the gardening industry to, be, to, to change and turn the industry as such into a kind of an arc supportive industry to, to take native plants on as being the most important part of any, any system that they're installing. Um, because, um, you know, basically native plants have evolved alongside all the other creatures. So there's very specialist relationships with them. 90% of all insects still only eat native plants. They haven't evolved as quickly as we're expecting them. They can't keep up with us, you know? We need them to relax and stay well and, and stay abundant because um, we've lost 75% of our insects in the last 25 to 50 years, which coincides completely with the onset of what they call the green revolution, which is chemical industrial farming um, and destruction of habitat and increase in temperature because of climate collapse. So what we're dealing with is, is um, a very difficult and scary situation called insectageddon. Insectageddon, it's called, that's what they've termed it. But basically, you know, if we run out of insects within the next 10 years, um, there will be 90% of all uh, flowering plants um, will, well, 90% of all plants will disappear from the earth because they won't be pollinated by insects anymore. They, they, poll they pollinate about 83% of flowering plants and crops. So um, when the plants go, we go. We only have about five months to survive after that, according to the scientists. So, um, you know, if you're looking at 10 years, if we keep going in the same traje trajectory, we, we, we have a slight problem. So we need to change everything because there is no other issue more important than surviving on our planet. Um, it's just not, I mean, COVID-19 is a walk in the park compared to what's coming if we don't change everything. And you know, unfortunately, we can't wait for the politicians because we've learned that, um, you know, they've done so many climate conferences like the Paris Agreement. Um, they, just, they just talk. Nothing has actually changed since they slapped each other's backs and talked about how wonderful they were. Um, it's really difficult because all of us feel quite powerless and you know it's it's hard to know what you can do to be of actual help out there you know but the arc actually is something really helpful um I, i'm not um i'm just going to go through what i'm going to do is i'm going to talk about um kind of just a little bit about the science behind um arcing i've got some nice pictures just to keep keep because they're just so pretty in between <laughs> But I'll just, just skip on here to um, where I want to talk about next, which is the law of diversity. So there's there's three kind of basic rules in, in ecology. They're written by Paul Shepard of, of the, the, the Sea Preservation Society, Sea Shepherd Preservation Society. And they're the only ones I, I really understood. So the law, the, the law of diversity, which is um, 
the first one is basically um, that everything is connected to everything else. And, you know, we kind of need the whole intricate web of life to be present in order for um, uh, the, keeping an, an ecosystem resilient and strong. And the more diversity is present, the stronger an ecosystem is. And we need the ecosystems not to collapse. So the, an ecosystem is the whole web of life. And every living creature in on the earth, seen and unseen, has a really important role to play in that web of life and we keep breaking the threads in that web and and the worry is that if, if you know at some point we could break the last structural thread and you wouldn't know what it is so like wolves would be a very obvious one because they're apex predators and there was a, a, a kind of a well-known story about Yellowstone National Park um, a number of years ago where they reintroduced wolves because the park park's ecosystem was degrading so quickly. So they reintroduced wolves. And as a result of reintroducing a pack of wolves, the, the deer kept away from certain places. They, they, they started to avoid the places where the wolves were. So they moved on quicker and allowed the plant ecosystems to recover, which made a huge difference. Um, the, the rivers actually changed shape as a result because um, because the, the riverbanks started to become more stable and the water slowed down. And, and when, a less obvious one would be um, starfish. There was a guy in um, uh, the west coast of America in, I think he did this experiment in the 70s. I can't remember exactly. Um, but he basically came up with an idea of um, Oh, it's a guy called Pain in the 1960s. Sorry, I have notes here that I occasionally look at and try and remember because my brain is phenomenally forgetful these days. But um, yeah, he took, he, he removed starfish from rock pools along the, the, the West Coast of America and observed what had happened. And um, like, it turns out that it's a keystone species because without the starfish, you commonly eat mussels. That's kind of what they eat. And um, the mussels took over and nothing else survived. Um, it became a monoculture of mussels. So that is a keystone species. Without the starfish, everything falls apart. So it, it's quite interesting, like, what, what creatures are keystone species. You'd be quite surprised. And the next law that um, he came up with was the law of interdependence, which is that all species within an ecosystem are dependent on the presence and the health of other native species in the local system. Um, because they, they've evolved alongside each other and they've many connections and kind of interdependent relationships that we're not even, that we're not even aware of most of the time. Um, so the, the thing to remember is that we, we have cut them off with islands and created all these tiny islands where a lot of species have been separated from each other and they're causing a collapse in the ecosystem. So one of the, the, the most obvious disconnection, um, the things that we've caused the disconnection with would be roads. Um, like, so this is a, the N11 from Dublin to Wexford and they erected this massive concrete uh, wall in the center of the road um, so it's, it's bad enough that, that, the, that wildlife has to deal with crossing a road full of really dangerous cars, but now when they get to the centre of it, they can't go any further. So we just haven't thought about anything else. We have not learned how to share and we're only thinking of ourselves and we're not connecting the dots. And so we are going to have to retrospectively, there's no doubt about it, if we, if we don't restore our ecosystems quickly we're going to have problems so we're going to have to look at um wildlife bridges and tunnels in all the roads um and maybe i would go so far as to say we need to remove cars from the roads altogether and just use the roads for walking and cycling and just put in a shit hot electric transport system and be done with it because you know this whole leaning towards electric cars is an absolute disaster as far as I'm concerned. It's just more rubbish. Um, a lot of the pollution from creating electric cars is just not talked about. People are not connecting the dots. And a lot of the pollution from cars are from ro rubber on the roads and salt on the roads and things like that. So it's not as simple as let's get an electric car and we're going to fix everything. It's just not that simple. So, and then the last one is the law of interdependence. Um, which is um, a very, just that everything is dependent on each other. I'm just missing, I'm gonna mess up my, um, my notes now. Oh yeah, now the first, the law of finite resources. 
um, is the next one. The law of finite resources. So the earth only has so many resources available. And when, I, when all the peat is gone, it's gone. When all the topsoil is washed into the sea and into the, into the rivers and out into the seas, it's, it's gone. And 75% of, of our topsoil has been washed into the rivers and the seas in the last, um, in the, since the beginning of the green revolution again. Um, uh, we're going to have to stop ploughing the land and we're going to have to reforest all the uplands. But anyway, um, sorry, I'll just get on to the archy stuff because I'm probably going on a bit long. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about arcing versus rewilding and what's the difference. So if you go back to those laws, um, in our tiny patches of gardens, we can't have wolves or you know all the all the creatures within it so what what i what i ask people to do is to step in and become all the different creatures um so to become uh to become the wolf become you know the beaver become the wild boar the idea is to create as many different ecotones as possible so ecotones are basically they're areas of an ecosystem which are kind of crossover points between two different ecosystems so to try and create as many different habitats or um, kind of in your garden as possible. So like you might, you might have a, a, a wetland um, uh, and a rocky area or, you know, a patch of bare earth, um, uh, a kind of a, a wildlife pond or even a basin of water, which um, has sticks in it to allow creatures to escape that they're not stuck in there. Um, you know, a meadow, a kind of a short kind of a clovery area um you know a, a kind of a a, a a shrubby scrubby land and then like a mature woodland um as many different uh, ecosystems as possible basically many different stages of ecosystem maturity as possible because naturally what would happen is that like the big creatures would come in and they would um you know the large mammals and, and herbivores would not normally knock down some of the trees and create kind of a light more light comes in and starts the system again or you know it depends on which parts of the world you're in but wild boar would dig up the earth and allow the annual weed seeds come out you know it's just to try and create as many different edges between different habitats as possible so this is um i'm going to just show you some pictures of a forest garden and an ark that we developed in um in north wexford but uh, you can follow them this you can follow us on irish forest garden on instagram claire and joe um live there i just helped them develop it this is what we were dealing with they had four acres of horse paddock and um if about four or five years ago we took it on and made a forest garden and then since have developed the rest of it into an arc so this um is what was there and then i'm going to show you some pictures of this is what was there um this is just you see it's just grass and nothing there apart from the horses and then this is like a before and after of the same picture um you can see that we've allowed things like the um um what you call these the thistles come out and they are completely covered in butterflies um when the butterflies are here um i'm sorry i put in a few doubles i don't know why oh i'm going the wrong way i'm going back okay um so I'll go down. Okay, so then when 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 they allowed the weed seeds to come out and we brought in cuttings from around and about and got in some extra, um, as many different types of native plants as they could, um, it's incredible what has, has happened really. The place is just filled. So that's, I don't know if you remember that picture a while ago there. I go back really fast. Oh, shite, hang on now. Sorry, I don't know why it's after doing that. Select all and open. Apologies, everybody on line there. <laughs> Why hasn't it opened? Um, preview, okay, ignore. My computer has decided to die. The joys of doing this stuff online, huh? Um, let me just scroll down really quickly here and find where we were. Okay, so there's Rob um, standing in the field uh, and then we come back to that. In a, there it is, that's it now. And that's it now. I mean, that's by allowing and adding in a few bits, a few bits and pieces, you know, and um, like certain things like you'd have to cut back the brambles a bit because naturally deer would be cutting back the, 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 the new shoots. Otherwise you'll have nothing but brambles. And also you have to, if there's no tree seeds emerging from the soil, 
if things have not are, are if you're disconnected from natural systems where you can't get the seeds into the land or it's been damaged already you have to add in stuff so um they dug out a wildlife pond just within a marley spot um and that's just incredible what's going on there um the amount of wildlife like just sitting by the pond and watching the creatures that come by it just fills your heart with joy and you and your heart expands to include all the creatures that um come and share your land with you now this can be even in the smallest window box um where we take soil from um if you can get soil from a neighbor just a bit of topsoil on top of um some organic peat free compost um and get the local weed seeds because there's 5,000 weed seeds in every square foot of soil and insects have actually adapted locally in very specific ways to their local to their local ecosystem plant ecosystem so sometimes their tongues will be longer or they're you know different they they have different relationships within an area so if you can get local weed seeds and I'm talking about things like thistles and nettles and whatever comes up when you put it into your window box and keep it watered that'll be like a service station on a motorway for insects coming past needing somewhere to refuel and um people put these tiny little this is an arc sign in their little messy um window box because there's no life in a tidy garden there's no life in 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 um in on you know you need mess like little messiness and dead wood and you know weeds are where and, and, and native plants are actually what constitute an arc. So these are just some of the things um, I'm going to just flick through these really quickly because I'm probably running out of time. Um, I'm just going to show you some of the lovely Claire has an amazing eye for taking pictures. So that's a couple of years in and it's about four years in, I think, but you can see they just cut, they cut, they cut pathways through what has become a natural kind of meadow and they um, and that gives you another eco, eco tone, which is the edge between the meadow and the, the mown path, you know. Um, and the amount of insect life that has come into this place is phenomenal. And um, the amount of bird life that follows the insect life in is amazing. Um, and then the forest garden, which was just that bare paddock, which we got pigs to clear, um, is now this phenomenally abundant, beautiful mini paradise. Um, as you wouldn't believe it was the same place. It's just amazing. Um, and that's that place there. So um, what are we going to talk about now? I'll just go through these few things. Yeah, so, so creatures that have come to live with them, like there's, there's hedgehogs, um, which um, there's all sorts of insects. Uh, there's, there's, this, there's the sparrowhawks. Um, uh, they've also had peregrine falcons, they've had owls. Um, uh, they, they just have the most incredible amount of creatures that have come back, the woodpeckers um, they've come, that have come back to live with them. And, and Claire and Joe don't want to leave because they're just surrounded by magic. And true nature is our true nature. Like it is magic, it's just amazing. And, even in the smallest patch, you can create magic and you get so much joy from, there's no comparison between a garden, which is like a, you know, an imposition of our own creative visual ideas of beauty and what the earth herself wants to do in order to, cre to create as much sanctuary and habitat as possible. Um, and having this kind of mini magical zoo surrounding your house as much as you can is really just amazing you know so i'm just going to say things like the seed heads the birds if you leave the seed heads in the winter it feeds the birds they just love them like you don't have to tidy everything up just leave them there They'll, it feeds everything um makes a huge difference to sustain creatures you know this whole tidying idea is a disaster um sorry i think see am i going to back again just the idea of a of a of a lawn you know, if a, a, a lawn is a green desert for a shared kin, basically, and, um, you know, some people's lawns are quite diverse already, and all you have to do is allow them to grow and maybe mow a path through them. And this would be an obvious example of not a sown lawn. This is a beautiful kind of a mixture of all sorts of wild, wild, wildlife, um, native plants, clovers. Um, mm. So basically, we would uh, just mow a path through that, and that would be a, na a natural arc. And then, um, you know, we're sharing because you, you can use your path to go places you can, you know, 
you can create little areas within it if you want, but just share it. We don't need it to be tidy and green. Um, it's much more alive and beautiful if it's full of creatures. Um, that's kind of a, a later autumny version of, of, of an arc meadow. It's, it's, it's not what you would normally see as a wildflower meadow. People still plant wildflower meadows for the color, for the show. Um, and it's very important if you are, if you are going to, to create an arc meadow to try and collect local weed seeds to use them. And if you can't do that, if you're in an urban space and it's just not possible, um, maybe just try very hard to buy locally, um, to try a local native organic uh, wildflower meadow and um, throw in some native grasses and some of the parasitic plants that'll keep the grasses down, such as um, uh, yellow rattle and things like that. Do I need to stop? I'm, I'm nearly there. Are you doing okay, Jane? Yes, go ahead, Mary. It's wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The, the, so these are just, I was just going to mention that the bramble or the thorn is, is the mother of the oak, um, that, that they're, they're in their nature's nursery. They're like, that's, that's the reason for being naturally tree seeds would come up through them and under them. It's the same with gorse. Um, they will die back after about eight years. And you'll see, like I have gorse in my, um, in the fields around my arc. Um, and after about eight years now, there's underneath the gorse, um, which is now surrounded by kind of the, the initial pioneer species of trees, which would be willow and birch. And I know this is Irish based, but this is all around the world. I'm just giving you some idea um, for my, my spot, which is Irish. Um, but uh, the gorse is now dying back from the shade of the other trees and the, old, and the understory trees are coming up like holly, and um, the larger trees like um, oak and things like that are actually they're there like there's jays now living in in in, in around me which is just phenomenal you know um, jays naturally plant oak seeds in the fields around them because they bury them like squirrels to to to, to harvest later so yeah that's the point about the brambles are the mother of the oak the seedlings come up that um, through this is that's a beech seedling which is a non-native but it's just an example of a tree seed coming up if it's left be um this is a dead hedge that claire made in her forest garden um and um it's just a, the dead hedge is an instant windbreak for any arc if you need to create an instant windbreak to create a place to, a sheltered place to grow your your to start your arc plant mm -hmm. ecosystems and um so these are basically just any kind of uprights that you pack full of dead wood or prunings. Um, you, can, you can ask your local landscapers to give you their offcuts if, if you can. Um, and you can create these wonderful dead edges to give you this instant kind of barrier and shelter belt. And they're great because they're full of insects and the birds absolutely feast on them. And just the idea of leaving the leaves, you know, these, these leaf blowers are an absolute disaster. They, burn all sorts of creatures to death um, try and stop tidying everything like there's a reason for the leaves a, a lot of larvae depend on the leaves to pupate um, they 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 like so many of them pupate in like like an oak tree has, has something like 300 or more species that are totally specialist dependent upon it on on eating oak leaves and part of that process would be about pupating dropping to the earth and pupating in the leaves underneath um, so just the amount of fungi and this is like the earth's winter blanket it's 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 a living oh my god the amount of life the ecosystem underneath the soil is is much more vast than the one above but we we kind of we keep stripping it of life by digging the soil um, because we've been told as gardeners to do that but actually that only gives you a burst of fertility and then most of our food as a result is grown in um, dead soil, which is completely dependent on, you know, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium that fertilizers that are given to the soil. Um, but there, most of our food now is actually, it has the dilution effect, which means like you'd have to eat one orange now instead of, or you'd have to eat 18 oranges now to get the nutrition of one, um, you know, 50 years ago, because all the macro and micronutrients are gone from the soil so th th there's there's very little nutrition in the food we're eating so they have to change the version of malnourishment so even though twenty five thousand people die of hunger every day there's a huge amount more that die of obesity and um, malnourishment from a different angle 
And so part of the arcing is that we ask people if they can share half their land and then the other half, if they could grow their own food um, in ways that are beneficial to the earth and um, uh, beneficial to creating um, nutritious food, again, by not digging at the no, di no dig methods and permaculture methods. Okay, so then I just want to talk to you about how this movement has spread all over the world. And we do have a map online, but I know most people don't want to put their arcs on the map because it's, a lot of people are quite aware of food security issues. And so they, they don't want to tell people where they are, but that's fine. I totally understand that. And um, lots of people are starting to put their arcs on the map, just general saying it's in Paris or it's in, it's wherever it's in Nigeria. It's not specific to their address, which is absolutely fine. Um, so it's really nice if you can share that. And then if you can share um, your signs online, it's really lovely um, to see them popping up all over the world. Um, these are just some of them. Uh, I've only got a few. Uh, I, I only managed to download a few. But um, that's the very first arc sign. Was clearly, I had, to up, I had to step up my game after seeing some of the others. <laughs> As they're so gorgeous. Um, that one's in Iceland. This is in Mauritius. Um, they're all over the world and it's really wonderful and heart heartening to see them. Um, so I think that's it. Yeah. Um, so thanks for listening, everyone. Um, and yeah, we'll do some questions now. It's probably the best thing to do. Yeah, Mary, thank you very much. That was really inspirational. Thanks and well. it's actually, um, it kind of, it made me realize the depth of our responsibility. I, I don't know whether, I think that everything you've said has made me think that it's really up to us humans. And in some ways, maybe I had thought of the, the arc as, as applying to maybe four acres, as you said, but it actually applies to our 10 meter by 20 meter garden just as well, or, or our window box. Okay. So I'm just conscious there's an awful lot of um, people online and there's a lot of people with questions. So I'll hand over to my colleagues, Sinead and Sinead, to go through those. Thank you, Mary. No problem. Thank you, Mary. That was really interesting. Okay. There's loads of questions coming in. So we, okay. myself and Sinead, will try and get through as many of them as we can. Okay. Um, the first one came in from Maria. It was... Uh, can you compost your veg vegetable peelings just by leaving them out? Um, because her compost heap gets very full, so she's just wondering, can she leave them out and dig them in around the garden? Yeah, there's there's different ways of doing it. I, I have um, a hot compost um, bin thing, which kind of, I can throw everything into, it's really handy, and, and it, it turns everything into, into compost really quickly. Um, I, think, I think I came across it on, on uh, the Chelsea Flower Show, weirdly, um, there was, uh, I, 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 I can't remember what the name of the company is now, but it's a hot composting bin and you can put meat and put everything into it. And it, 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 it gets up to 120 degrees and <laughs> it's just like everything turns to soil really fast. Um, but yeah, you can dig them. As far as I know, you can, I know that people do, they dig holes um, and bury their compost in it and cover it with soil. Um, I suppose, um, one of the non-native invasive creatures, but one thing I didn't talk about was invasive plants. And I really, I'm really strong about this, is that we have to remove non-native invasive plants from our arcs, which is very difficult to do on a large scale, but it's, it's easy enough to do on, on, in our small areas by hand. We don't use chemicals, there's no chemicals allowed in any arc. I'm really hardline on that as well. But um, my point is that like one of the non-native creatures that we have to deal with is rats and they, you know, so I'm like, you don't really want to bring them around your house too far. So I'd say if you're going to be digging it in underneath the earth, I'd put them as far away as possible from you, just that you don't, you don't want to encourage them. But if, if it's dug, dug into a hole and then covered with earth, you shouldn't have any problem. But I, I know that's a lot of, that's a pain in the bum. Anyway, lots of people have compost heaps and they live happily with the rats. The rats are grand, you know. Um, once you develop a, a strong ecosystem, like Claire has rats in her ark, but she also now has owls um who love eating all her rats so there's a balance and so you're pr providing food for them as well you know so it's fine once once you've got enough space you can get on with it and and accept living with creatures they just have they're here we, we it's kind of hard to get rid of them you know yeah. thank thanks mary that, that that was great i have another question from lizzie who would love to know the best way to get started on a tight budget financially and time-wise 
she's really keen to learn small sustainable steps that can build okay on um, one another I think I wrote that down somewhere okay well it, it doesn't cost anything basically so if you have land is it Lizzie that said it Lizzie if she yeah. has any land at all or a window box or whatever it is it's all about first of what I would first of all suggest is to stand back and watch and observe and see and just leave it be and see what happens you know if you have some some area of land that isn't under hardscaping if you've got hardscaping which is like paving or anything like that I I would suggest lifting and skipping or passing on to another friend um, any paving yeah don't skip it that's terrible just give it to someone else who needs a few paving stones or whatever um, um and just allowing the earth to breathe and releasing the weed seed bank from the soil so a weed the weed seed bank if you've got healthy soil there's usually about five thousand weed seeds in every square foot of soil and they only need one thirtieth of a second's worth of light to activate and emerge um so the weed seeds are kind of nature's kind of uh first line of defense for healing her skin which is the earth um, the soil, the topsoil. And um, after that, other things emerge like the thorny plants and the pioneer trees and things like that. But um, you mightn't have room for a tree, but you will probably have room to coppice a tree. So you grow a tree and when it's getting too big for you, cut it at the base and allow it to become a multi stem shrub. Um, so that will still support um, different levels of life. We, 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 we worked with woodland management for thousands of years by coppicing trees. It was very it was a very gentle and archy way to, to live with nature, you know, rather than destroying everything with monocultures of spruce, which are poured, have chemicals poured on them from the skies. And, you know, they're, they're acidifying the soil and they have nothing living underneath them. Um, and, and unfortunately, because of shifting baseline syndrome, our children don't know any better. They think that those monocultures of spruce are what the woods are. You know, and, and I should just, inter sorry for going off on a tangent, but the, our ancient woodlands, there's 0.02% of our ancient woodlands left in Ireland. And they are so important because they contain all the diversity we need and nobody is protecting them. Only people like me, um, I, I'm not doing anything about it actually, sorry, but what I mean is people who aren't government are doing it. So people like the Woodland League, um, the Native Woodland Trust, the Irish Wildlife Trust, they're the people who are stepping up and trying to protect those tiny pockets of ancient woodland because without them, we're completely screwed um, because that's where our diversity is actually held. And they're like the seeds of hope for the future. They need to be protected at all costs. So if anybody listening has any way of protecting or has any of that ancient woodland on their land please protect it Can contact the woodland league um and ask them to help you and they will they'll be delighted to sorry anyway more questions sorry yeah um next one is from um anonymous they want to know um some advice on starting a small starting in a small urban garden what would work best for them that question came in from a few different people okay um well, I suppose the first steps would be um, trying to create as many different layers as possible. So you, 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 you ditch the chemicals, you put up a sign, make your own sign. We're not selling anything here. Make your own sign to explain to the neighbors why, why your gardens turned into what they would consider messy because you will find lots of neighbors will come over and offer to clean it up for you because they'll feel sorry for you. So, <laughs> so if you put up a sign saying this is an ARC with the website underneath to explain to people where the arc.org, that, that helps. Um, if you wouldn't try and talk to your neighbors and ask them, would it be okay if you created holes in your barriers, in your walls or your fences? Um, so that creatures can actually move between spaces because we've cut up all their little territories way too much and they have no access um, people are usually okay with creatures like hedgehogs coming in but then you thought also please ask your neighbors to stop using chemicals like slug pellets if they do because they kill all the the birds and the hedgehogs and they're all the other creatures who come along and eat the poison snails and slugs you know that joined up thinking doesn't exist but a lot of the time it's just information they people don't know that that happens they just haven't they're just so disconnected that they don't know um, you could turn your you could allow your lawn to grow and see if it's full of diversity and if it's not then there's a few ways of doing it um 
Klaus Leitenberger has this great new book out. It's, um, he's an Irish uh, uh, grower, organic grower. It's called The Self-Sufficient Garden. I just think it's fabulous. And, and in it, he, he, he suggests the laziest but very effective method for converting your lawn into a productive kind of, well, he's using it to, to create a productive vegetable plot. But so he would completely cover your grass with um, um, manure, like well-rotted manure. And then he'd cover it with plastic, but you can do it without the manure. You can just cover it with plastic. But if you want to, to, to one way of doing it is to, he puts holes in through the plastic and puts in pumpkin seeds. And then you get this lovely harvest of pumpkin seeds. And um, what else does he use? I can't remember now, I have to look at it. Um, oh, I can't remember. Uh, anyway, other creatures, I think it was pumpkins and squash or something like that and um and so you get a great harvest while you're waiting for your lawn to die basically and then when you lift that up um it'll be it'll be ready for you to plant in native arc uh plants um so that would be you know like if you want to put in a wildflower meadow i mean you know i know that people say you really have to destroy the the topsoil and strip it and create a um subsoil layer because wildflowers only like uh, non-fertile soil um, but it just goes against every bone in my body to say that because the ecosystem in the soil is just as important and we need to protect that um, so I suggest putting in arc meadow seeds things that like that rich soil like nettles and thistles which you know are incredibly important because without those creatures we'll have no like um, like uh, the, like a lot of the butterflies would have very specialist relationships with nettles, for example, like the small tortoise shell or the red admiral. They 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 their babies, the larvae, only eat nettles. So if they don't have any nettles, they don't. We don't have any of those creatures. So um, just you know, we have to come away from thinking it has to be pretty and think how can I help? What can I do? How many creatures can I support with? Which how many plants can I get in here to support as many creatures as possible? Um, so as many native plants as you can fit in there would be the way to go. If you can't do the plastic thing, you can get double loads of cardboard boxes from a great place to get them from is like, you know, where those shops that sell white goods, uh, washing machines and fridges and because they have huge cardboard boxes out the back and they're usually happy to get rid of them. And, um, you put layer, put three layers of cardboard down, stripped of all the tape on top of the area of lawn you're going to turn into an arc um, and soak it and then um, get some topsoil from somewhere else in the garden, spread it over the top um, um, and uh, a couple of rocks to keep everything down, keep it moist and well and you can throw in some more locally local collected weed seeds or um, um, or you can plant a wildflower meadow on top of that. Now, Sandra Cafola does great wildflower meadows in Ireland. Um, on our website, we have loads of um, connections in the links and resources for different parts of the world where you can get native seeds, um, or you can just Google it yourself, you know. Uh, I hope that helps in terms of how to start. Really lawns, getting rid of lawns. <laughs> Do you know there's 40 million acres of lawn in America alone, um, which is just ridiculous. It's the most heavily irrigated crop in America, um, in the USA, sorry. And, um, you know, lawns are a disaster. And they come from a class system, which is long gone. People only ever had lawns if they had enough wealth not to grow their own food on all the land they had. So there's only wealthy people who were able to have lawns. And it was only after the industrial revolution when we got rid of, um, when people started to say, oh, I'm going to have a lawn around my house because it indicates that I'm doing really well, that I'm I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm on the pig's back here. I don't have to grow food everywhere, you know? And that's, we made a huge mistake in disconnecting ourselves from growing our food. That was the, the biggest mistake we made because industrial agriculture fishing and farming and forest forestry is killing everything on the planet. So we're going to have to go back to supporting locally, supporting local organic growers, local organic producers, um, regenerative farming, try and grow as much of your own food as you can um, because we have to step out of those systems. They're completely destroying everything and we're out of time um, to, so if you, can, if you can find a local community supported agriculture, a local CSA or a box scheme, um, try and do as much as you can support local organic producers. Sorry. Anyway, I go off on tangents. 
Thank, th thanks, Mary. We actually had Clive spoke to us um, in, in Waterford Library a number of years ago. He was a very, very inspiring speaker. So I have another question from Claire. She's studying horticulture in college and um, she is wondering what guides or resources. You mentioned a few there. Would you recommend? She knows about the National Biodiversity Data Centre, particularly for people trying to design arc type types while they're studying horticulture. Um. Well, if you actually, we have a really great links and resources page on our own website, Claire. Um, and I'm, I've actually just written the book on how to build an ark. Um, and I'm hoping to get it out there as quickly as I can, because I, I see it on the We Are The Ark Facebook page and people are quite confused about it. Like, so um, I need to I need to make it I, I need to detail it out and get it out there as quickly as I can, because, you know, I don't think we've time to be messing around you know and um so i need to get the book out as quickly as possible so that people know what, what to do you know um uh, sorry claire i don't have the book out yet <laughs> but anyway it'll be out soon enough but but i hopefully have as much i i have to update the website and add in more succinct um information so that you don't have to buy the book you can you can look at the website either you know um and get us get the basics anyway perfect um, I have one here from, I think, Ethel. I think I'm pronouncing that right. She has four rats living in the wall in her garden, which she doesn't mind, but she's just wondering how they, she might control the numbers before they start breeding and multiplying. I, 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 I don't know. I mean, my, my <laughs> it's very difficult. You have to find what their food source is. So, you know, I don't know. And I, I don't like talking about getting rid of creatures, but I do know if you can try and get an, an, a natural ecosystem going, um you will find that um i know it's difficult in a small urban garden i don't know what to say to you i just i wouldn't know what to do myself if i had kids there and i do have kids and i know you don't want them around your kids because they can carry all sorts of mad diseases but it's just difficult to know how to tackle that i don't actually have the answers for that you can get these traps where you put them into the trap and then carry them far away um so you can get i think there's some like they're humane traps where you put food in and then the, the door closes and then you can carry them off somewhere, which, you know, I do feel sorry for them because you're taking them away from their families, but I don't think killing any creatures is, is, is a great plan on, on, I, I know that I do, I just, I just find it very difficult to kill anything, you know, but this, the reality is that we have to kill things to survive. Like plants are just as sentient as, any other creature as far as I'm concerned. And it's the reality of life that we do need to, um, oh, I don't even know. I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't talk about killing anything. Don't like it. Okay, Mary, I have another question for you here. <laughs> what, what, what are your thoughts on perennial vegetable gardens or food forests that provide a yield? Could these still constitute an arc? And that's from Mark. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're saying if you can give half of it to a food forest or if you already have all your lot, land covered in food forests, that's OK, too. But this because they're very abundant and um, because the first book I wrote was about food forests. I love food forests and perennial vegetables and kind of creating an abundant system like that. Um, but you can always add in more native plants. You can always add in more support systems in it, whether it's just around the boundaries or within the space itself, like the dead hedges or the ponds or um, whatever else there is. But the, the more diversity you have in a system, the stronger it will be and the less problems you'll have with pests because um, you'll have the natural predators come to stay there as well. Okay, Thank you. Where am I there? Um, I have one from Linda here. She wants to know um, any books or websites that you could recommend on creating small scale forest gardens or do you know of any workshops that are coming up on doing this? Um, no. No, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. So then yeah. My, so my, uh, Martin, what's his name? Martin, 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 Martin. It's not Martin Hayes. He's a fiddle player. Um, he has a forest garden um, in England. It's a two acre one. Um, my own book is talks about small ones, um, but I, I'm not trying to sell that. But you can get it in the library, Washford, though. <laughs> um, um, someone has said Crawford. Is that right? Crawford. Martin Crawford. Crawford. Yeah, that's yes. I couldn't think of his name. <laughs> Perfect. Thank yeah. you, everybody. <laughs> yeah, and there's great books on forest gardening out there. Like, if you just have to Google it, you'll have a great selection, you know. If you can find one that's for your native area, that's great. There isn't a lot of light in, say, Ireland, so you, you would maybe have to space things a little further 
than people tell you to, just so that you always have more light. That's all. So Sheila has an acre that she's left untouched for many years by planting some native trees. She's loads of nettles, brambles, thistles, but over time, the open spaces have become completely covered with rushes. Mm. Does she leave it alone or control them a bit? What is your advice? Well, I mean, um, they, would, they would naturally be controlled to a large degree by different creatures. So like I go back to what I said at the beginning, if, if your land has been completely taken over by brambles or whatever, then you need to step in and become, you know, the full ecosystem, which is missing. So you'd need to cut back the brambles and introduce more diversity yourself. Um, so you might want to mow some of the a path through the rushes and um, or maybe plant some more um, maybe wetland friendly, you know, maybe scrubby willows in there with them or, you know, to create just to create more diversity. So the more diverse of a, of a system you can put in there with native plants, the more um, the, the more creatures you're going to be supporting. Um, that's basically it. So like any any of those questions that come in about I've let it go and it's completely taken over by something then step in and add more in you know um create as many different ecotones as possible many layers of 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 ecosystem as possible and the next one from Brian is how large an area at minimum is needed to make an arc okay well you see you're not going to be able to make it um you know you need you need 1500 acres to have um a full working ecosystem with the with the wolves and everything you know the, um so like you know but we have arcs that big in america and we have window boxes um in norway you know on our map and um you know it's just different as much space as you have and how many different layers of ecosystem can you put in there many different habitats can you fit in it it's up it's up to you even if it's only a window box it's still an arc. It's still helpful. It's still part of the solution rather than the problem. And uh, one more, Mary, if you only have pots, what can you grow for the arc? A really good question, I think. Yeah, so it's like a window box. You, 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 if you can source some um, organic peat-free compost and then try and either get a little bit of topsoil from a neighbor which has weed seeds in it because again remembering that insects have locally adapted to their local ecosystem so we we the weed seeds from your particular area within like i think they say about a 10 mile radius um are the ones you need to fill up and and allow space because plants are actually becoming extinct at much rate faster rate and everything else because the, 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 the wildlife gardening narrative is to plant things like buddleias and lavenders and all those things. And they're pushing out. So the pollinators are so interested in feeding from those big showy flowers and gardeners think they're doing some, so much good by putting them in. Um, but the pollinators are, as a result, ignoring the native plants, which are then not getting to set seed. So the native plants need space. The plants need space. And without the plants, we won't have the insects and on and on and on. So, um, and the other way around, without the insects, we won't have the plants. So we need to support, they, we need to support them so that they can live, so that we can live. So, um, where was I? What was I talking about? Oh, I don't know why I talked about that. I'm completely gone blank now. Where was I, Sinead? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we uh, Sinead has one more question from you, and then we'll um, just to go back to the pot for a second, yeah, Fill it up with like whatever you can, like go around when the weed seeds in the local area are set and seed, go to the wastelands around you, find the weed seeds, take the seeds, put them into your pots. That's how you do it, or put in a native shrub. Um, because native shrubs, the leaves are they're, they're food for larvae as well. Like just, just stick to native plants and make sure that if you're buying them from a local garden center or a nursery, you question them, whether they have been grown here locally, whether they've been grown without chemicals, because a lot of gardening plants are outside of the laws for agriculture, so they can still use nic neonicotinoid seeds and things, which are systemic and persistent within the life cycle of the plant. And they'll just damage the insects that come to feed them. And that'll build up, it doesn't leave the plant. So make sure that your plants are organic. 
shouldn't have to ask, but that's where we're at. And, and demand that they put in an arc section and get those native plants going in the garden centers, you know, because you can have beauty all around you on much deeper levels than, you know, this weird concept of as much color and, you know, kind of creative expression as possible. It's just, I know what I'm saying is very challenging, but I think it's important that we survive. <laughs> So the, the last one is from Lisa, and I'm sure this is an exchange that goes on in many a household. She has a more, a more obsessed husband, and she spends her time singing to her, her wildflowers. Mm. So she just wants to know what would be the best compromise between them? Should she just leave one area designated as a meadow, or what should they do? Well, moors, okay, moors are, are, you know, a bit of a disaster from a carbon footprint point of view they 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 they're, <laughs> they're really a disaster a scythe is the way to go if you can get them into scything it's really great <laughs> there's some great sides for sale um but um and there's those old push mowers when we're young but if you can try and get them just to mow a, a path rather than the whole thing and just try and get his um you know try and get him into photography and take pictures of all the insects in the garden that come back or you know just just generally people go on the moor because they feel that they're creating a nice controlled environment and there is a certain peace that comes from that but it's a very masculine peace and I'm trying to instill a feminine peace which comes from allowing things to be what they are you know because women are you know the, the embodiment of the feminine energy and the earth has been used and abused in the same way that the feminine energy has been and we've had enough of having to be either productive or pretty and young in order to be um, considered beautiful. Um, so, you know, about allowing the land to become what it wants to become and supporting it to be as diverse as possible is really where we're at. And um, what was I want to say there? Check, I can't remember now. Doesn't matter, it's gone out of my head, sorry. What you're saying is beautiful anyway, Mary. <laughs> that last problem, I think, maybe just split the garden down in two. That yeah. might be the only solution. That's it. That's a good way of doing it. Yeah, yeah maybe. You know, it's been it's been a wonderful evening, and I'm I really hate to be the one to wrap up because we really haven't had enough time, and I'm just conscious. What I'm really conscious of is the huge amount of sharing of information that went on by the participants, mm -hmm. and maybe I'll really upset the techies now by saying that. Uh, you know, is there any way we can capture that? Because there was all kinds of websites and everything going up through the evening. And I know, Sinead, you've promised to uh, email everybody with information about the rest of the week's programme after this. And perhaps maybe we could give them a list of the websites that were mentioned as well. And one in particular was mentioned was quickcrop.ie, which was a place to get your hot bin, which I thought that was that was kind of useful. And I know that Klaus Lattenberg, the book was mentioned, and there was a big page in Saturday's Irish Times about that book. And um, it's available. And again, we'll be able to find the website and send that on to people too. And obviously, Mary, we would be welcoming you back with open arms when you have your book published. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll be very happy to, to promote it through the libraries and everything. But just to go very quickly, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. And thanks very much to Sinead O'Higgins and Sinead Cummins there for all the work you've done for, in the build up to this and also uh, during, during the evening. But just, I would like to just mention that this is the first keynote speaker of the whole week of events. And we have tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, beads, bees, birds and trees, um, biodiversity and Waterford Council, where we have four members of staff from the council are going to sit on the panel and talk about what Waterford Council are doing uh, for biodiversity. On Wednesday, we have um, Neil Tarrant, who has created the wonderful digital wildlife map of Ireland, and he'll be speaking at 11 o'clock on Wednesday. On Thursday, then we have a pre-recorded piece from MEP Grace O'Sullivan, and this will be live on the uh, on facebook.com slash EU Direct and Europe Direct Waterford YouTube, YouTube channel. And then on Friday, you can learn how to spot spring flowers and become a citizen scientist with Ocean Duffy. So that's what's happening for the rest of the week. Um, as, as I said, we'll email you the information after this or else in the morning. And just to mention a uh, big thanks to Europe Direct. We have a Europe Direct Centre in Waterford. It's based in Waterford Library. And the whole idea of that centre is 
um, to show people how the EU is relevant in their lives and offer information and to facilitate connections. And I think that uh, this, this is an example of how that can be done. And thank you to all the people who attended because as I said, the chat was just amazing. And Mary, thank you, you're wonderful. No problem, can I just say, because people are asking there, it's, it's we are the arc dot org so the arc is a k it's acts of restorative kindness to the earth so we are the arc dot org just so they, they have it thank you so much for having me on i appreciate it thanks